Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Aladdin Brioli. I will start by describing myself for blind or low vision people. I'm white, I have a pale skin, dark brown hair, brown eyes, and a characteristic mole on my right cheek. I'm wearing a dark shirt and I'm sitting in front of a white background. Next to me, there is Ellen that will let herself. Hi, I'm Ellen. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I have tan skin, uh, dark brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm wearing a uh, fluorescent, almost fluorescent yellow blouse with a microphone pinned to the middle of it. For the intimacy machine, I've been mostly contributing through writing. So I will briefly introduce you how the launch will unfold and then present the other collaborator that with us tonight. So first we will discuss and introduce the intimacy machine with Ellen. Then we will navigate the platform with Ari and Yoris. Then there will be a music part by Laurent Gudel of about 15, 20 minutes. And then there will be a conclusion opening questions with Ellen as well. So I would like to thank uh, profoundly IBEAM for the, the chance with this fellowship, but also uh, LABEC, who was a partnership of the project as well. And I would love to thank all the uh, scholars and beekeepers that helped me help us to build this project. However, the list will be endless. So thank you all of you and all the names and all the contribution are available on the intimacymachine.net platform that we will launch together right now in the next hour. So I will first invite Ari Block and Joris Lenman to the stage. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so Joris, you can start. I'll start with a visual description, a description of myself for uh, visually impaired and low vision people. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Amsterdam and English is not my first language. Uh, I'm a 50 year old Caucasian person uh, with light skin. Uh, I have dark eyes and dark eyebrows. I'm wearing a dark blue shirt. Uh, I'm bald and the hairs that I have are uh, razor very short. Um, I have some stubble on my cheeks and on my chin and on my mustache area, uh, which is quite gray. Uh, I'm in my studio in Amsterdam. Uh, it's night here, so there's artificial light and you see a day planner with some high lit uh, events on it. Um, I'm Harry Block. I work with uh, Joris. We have a studio, uh, Joris Blondman. I will describe myself as well. I am as well uh, in Amsterdam. I'm uh, in my living room where you can see two white uh, walls, one with a picture with uh, colorful cups and uh, plates. I'm a Caucasian, quite uh, pale, with uh, light brown uh, hair, gray eyes, and I wear a black uh, pullover. And uh, I think that's it. Yeah, as a addition to the visual uh, description, people uh, often say that Ari looks like a superhero and me maybe like a supervillain. Um, uh, also, maybe we can give a brief introduction to the studio that we have. Uh, we have a graphic design studio focusing on uh, the intersection between uh, graphic design tradition and screen-based design digital experiment. Uh, so we do a lot of websites, digital stuff. Uh, we work a lot with cultural uh, organizations and makers. Anything to add to that, Ari? No, that's perfect. Aladdin. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. And at least, but, at last but not least, uh, Laurent, I would like to invite Laurent Gudel as well to the stage to introduce you. To him. Hello. Do you hear me? Perfectly. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laurent Gudel. I am currently in Switzerland. I am a Caucasian man with a light skin. I have dark hair and dense beard and dark hair too. I am wearing a very soft and comfortable black velvet pullover. 
I have been collaborating with Aladdin Borioli for a few years now. Uh, I am an experimental electronic musician and sound artist. I like noise, interferences, politics of sound. Um, as you may have noticed, my mother tongue is French and I hope you can understand me despite my accent. I am sitting in my apartment, which is also my studio, my sound studio. Um, there is a wide wall next to me where you can see many audio cables hanging. You can also see a microphone right next to me, lamps in the background, and in front of me there's a very cheap Sony tape recorder. It's a tape machine that I bought in a flea market just in front of my house. This is a very outdated machine. It doesn't work perfectly, but I'm still going to use it to play a composition that mixes hisses, noises from the inside of different hives, but also noises, noises coming from the electronic in instrument that I'm using. I thought it would be interesting to give it a try and mix new and old technologies. Uh, this is the first time that I play sound through Zoom and I hope everything will go well. Thank you very much. Uh, it was perfect. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to go well, like in the rehearsal. Uh, before starting, I'd just like to thank all of you really much for this collaboration. It was amazing to work with you. And yeah, without further ado, let's dive in. Yeah, so I guess like this first part, we just thought we'd uh, just give an overview quickly of the intimacy machine and talk through some of the ideas behind it. And perhaps it's best coming from you as the creator behind this project, just briefly, like what is the intimacy machine? Yeah, sure. I, I won't be too long there because we've been a bit on that. but. Basically, the idea is, was to create a machine that challenged the forthcoming of digital technology in the world of beekeeping. I mean, for example, using sensors that are directly inserted into beehives, uh, different type of sensors like scales, temperature, humidity, microphones, in order to gather continuously those data and then publish them on a platform where beekeeper can access this data and monitor the hive remotely. So this make our eyes, we can call it then smart eyes. And this could actually, if it's fully take on, which is not the case at the moment, could drastically change the practice of beekeeping in order to develop less intrusive and less time consuming practices. While the promise of this technology is really high, in its current status, I believe it is a lure that could only lead to the, to the proletarianization of beekeepers and finally, to the replacement by ill-designed cybernetic machines. It's a lure because it's based on the same ideology of careless and manic production that have already destroyed many worlds before and. So what we're trying to do with the intimacy machine is center the question of intimacy that beekeepers have traditionally developed with their bees and design a platform that utilizes this same technology, but instead its premise is based on the idea of care rather than productivity or colony management. Yeah, and I guess that's like what we were discussing a lot in the text, which is available um, to read on the website, which accompanies this, is that um, there's kind of a big misunderstanding about bees in that uh, humans have ascribed this metaphor to them of them being like really industrious workers. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. And I think it's it's really interesting to talk about metaphor when it comes to bees, because that reminds us of the amazing talk by Aza at the beginning, like how metaphor could be useful uh, in order to understand and grasp other, other beings and non-humans. But at the same time, bees knows a lot about metaphor and we've been inscribing metaphor to them all over history. Like they've been symbols and metaphor for all our political ideology from monarchism, communism to anarchism, and nowadays democracy. But there's one metaphor that never really left the world of bees, the idea of bees in walking bees, basically the busy bees, the industrious worker. But I think it's really important to understand that this metaphor could be damaging. And uh, bees are lazy, bees are also idle, bees also like to play. And I think that this metaphor is insinuating that they produce only and they're just here to produce only and pollinate our crops, right? So, yeah, this is a bit what we want to challenge with the intimacy machine and 
think and let the viewer to discover the world of bees differently from another angle. Yeah, and I mean, I guess like we talked about it as well as the platform acting as a kind of refuge. And I guess this idea of an internet refuge is really important nowadays, not only due to the impact of the pandemic, but also um, it's important to have these kinds of opportunities to find or create spaces which maybe are not possible um, in real life um, for communities that have been overlooked, and that includes non-humans. And so the Intimacy Machine hopes to offer a space for the creation of new worlds with wider accessibility for all, because it also acknowledges that the current world is irreparable. And I guess within beekeeping specifically, it's very much a tech uh, that's still in the making, um, as I understand. Unlike in other fields where the Internet of Things and these kinds of smart devices are like proliferating everywhere, um, perhaps with beekeeping at least, uh, the, intimacy machine, the intimacy machine stands a good chance at having an impact and maybe hacking this technology from the outset. Yeah, I mean, the, the world of beekeeping, it's really slow to take into new technology and it's also not really been a focus. Uh, as it's, it's much in farming and different fields. And yeah, I think you, you're telling really why the idea of the machine is to create a refuge where you can encounter this bee on another basis. And then the, techn but the technology that is used so far is following and built on the same principle that have, that have basically led farming and on the same idea of just motivated by wealth and power. Yeah, and then I guess we can all sort of agree that if technology development just remains in the hands of the technology capitalists, um, then, you know, it's, it's not going to be created for the greater public good. I mean, we've already seen the results of racial algorithms reflecting implicit, bi implicit biases already within the real world. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something we try to, to do and to take a little bit of control back and like putting ourselves also in the, in the maker of this technology and in the future and questioning the question of infrastructure and something that has been left behind a lot uh, in some thinking that we close to, I believe. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess through like the fact that you did ethnographic research as well, um, you've like worked together with scientists and beekeepers as well. Um, and so you're looking at creating a technology like which is acknowledging that perhaps humans do create or some humans at least create the most harm. And how can you rebuild a technology that um, you know refocuses and, and senses this kind of control um, and, and do that sensitively? And maybe just to take a step back, um, which I guess perhaps for people that don't know you might suddenly wonder where is this interest in bees come from? Like why bees? Yeah, I think people that know me knows it well, but otherwise uh, I will maybe just share a picture to answer that. Uh, Briefly, oh, really sorry, it's not that. Is that. So this is the apiary of my grandfather. So this is the, the place when about probably 10 years ago, I started to help him uh, because he was aging and beekeeping is quite a difficult task. I mean, you have to carry a lot of, a lot of holes. So yeah, I, I learned there in this sacred place with him. It was been like a really safe place for me and I was spending a lot of time with him and with his bees at the time. And I think I will never forget. And I was, I got really quickly hooked when I entered this place, like the smell or the sound. And since then, I didn't do anything else than walking on bees, basically. Like, <laughs> yeah, for the last, I don't want to count the year, but it's been still a really big source of motivation. This is where he started also. I, I like to thank him for that. They unfortunately passed away last year, but yeah. And yeah, I mean, I would agree as well, like having also spent time in the apiary myself, like beekeeping is hard physical work and it's something that is very time consuming. And that's something that this kind of new technology is actually trying to take away um, time. And um, and I guess like it reflects an idea we also discussed in the text about beekeeping being an amateur hobby. It's something that's really centered on care, patience, time and revisiting. And that reflects as well in your ethnographic research, but stands in direct contrast to the instant monetary transactions, consumerist ideologies and the current status of smart hive. 
Um, so perhaps it's interesting to just briefly mention um, how you move from it being an amateur hobby into a subject of your research. Yeah, sure. I, I can go on that. Maybe before closing the picture, I can just quickly describe it. So this apiary is located in Bavaria, Switzerland. Uh, in the middle of the picture, you see like a little wooden cabin with a light beam on it. The roof is really old and there's a lot of moss in it, on, on top of it. And on the right, you can see some of the beehives and inside you can see my granddad veil and some old beehives that we keep in it. So, yeah, uh, as you said, uh, as I, I mean, I always studied this question since I was doing art school, but later on, I got in and doing visual anthropology where we study actually together. And I've been starting an ethnography during this master about the forthcoming of this technology and the latest tech in the world of beekeeping and questioning how this could change actually our relationship with them and the practice of beekeeping. Yeah, and I guess that also makes me think like because we did study visual anthropology together, um, how important the idea of collaboration has been to a central part of how we both work, um, which probably comes from the discipline of anthropology in trying to correct its early endeavours where the anthropologist was like an accomplice to white colonisers who invaded foreign lands, made subjects out of colonised peoples. And I think anthropology now has really shifted to focusing and championing doing anthropology at home stress that, uh, that the participants are no longer subjects, they're also collaborators. And it encourages participatory and self-reflexive projects, which is something that, you, that you know, we're all trying to do here with the intimacy machine. And whilst most obviously you've worked with a team to produce it, um, the contributors of the data are also very much part of it. They're regular interlocutors, each entry is sourced with credit, you keep them updated, and have continually asked for their consent and feedback in the development of the platform. And likewise, it aims to be beneficial for them. Um, it's a place for them to share their research, and it's not just uh, you know only taking from one side. And of course, like with putting bees at the center, I guess the ultimate aim is for them to be the collaborators as well, perhaps to the point where human involvement could completely step away. Um, but maybe that's a bigger story. <laughs> no, but we're going there. <laughs> Yeah, but as you said, like, yeah, collaboration has been central to APN and also to the Intimacy Machine. And we've been collaborating extensively with Aaron Yoris, and I've been collaborating extensively with you and also much with Laurent in the past last year. So now, now we'll go into, into it and I will start sharing uh, the platform and we will explore it together. So let me get into that. There we go. So welcome to the Intimacy Machine. Uh, we will navigate, we will do a walkthrough all together. We will exchange with Aaron Yoris, who designed it, taught it through, and yeah, explain some of the content and go a bit through it. So I will, yeah, maybe we can just shortly describe the, the platform. So it's, uh, you see a lot of green, uh, it's like, uh, Lot of square, white square in a and a green grid, and there's uh, some in each square have some images or a play button when it's sound that show a little clip of what's inside the data. Maybe if I can interview, uh, I would say when when you came to to us with uh, your project, you. You, you said you, you had like a big collection of data that you wanted to show to, to people, that you wanted to, to show a different way to, to navigate in, data, in this data to, to motivate people and visitors to, to access the, the data for people who have the knowledge and know it, and as well for people who would be more uh, like a bit tourist, like just seeing stuff and uh, wanted to, to know more. So we, uh, we, we start to... to with this uh, collection, and uh, we had this uh, this visual ID. Uh, wh when I was a kid, I had like on my wall this kind of uh, cupboard with like small uh, box when you can put so small stones or small stuff you 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 found, and uh, and I think Yoris had the, had the same too. And it was this kind of okay, with this, this kind of idea of collection of uh, 
when you put stuff in a small box. And uh, this layout came a bit of it to, to have like a, a huge grid where there is like every grid is a small box where you can have a, like a small uh, gem uh, inside it. So yeah, <clears throat> to, to add to that, um, I did have a similar box of trinkets um, and uh, this adds to the notion of value. So while, I, while we're speaking, uh, Aladdin is also um, navigating the grid a bit freely to show some uh, movement there. But um, indeed, we uh, spoke about uh, a, a grid, a cabinet uh, in which you can access all these little treasures. And we also spoke about metaphors uh, that you also spoke about earlier and thinking about ways to not um, hmm, propagate these metaphors that might be uh, harmful or incorrect or practically incorrect. So we didn't, we ended up not wanting to use uh, black and yellow, is uh, black and yellow stripes or uh, hexagon shapes. Um, so in the end, we landed in this bright green color. Maybe, it, it, yeah, it, it's a bright green color that refers perhaps to quite nostalgically to computing in a way, maybe. Uh, um, I take it away. <laughs> <laughs> so here, uh, Aladdin uh, opened the machine. So ba basically, the, the grid uh, work in uh, two ways. There, there is like a kind of uh, uh, object next to each other in a grid, and there is like a, a grid with sticks. So if if we go back uh, maybe to to the to the main uh, page, uh, so when you move, like the content moves, but the grid is not moving. It's only when you stop to to scroll that it will uh, be fixed in place. And then you will see where is the limitation, the limit between the different objects. So it's in a way something with uh, completely structured and uh, square, but at the same time, it's always breaking when uh, when you are like moving into it and reconstructing when when you stop. When you activate one grid or one machine, as we call uh, them, the grid open and then like a circle uh, grow and show like a black uh, room where there is a content. Mostly they are like uh, image content in this room. This one is like a video uh, machine. So there is a, a player and you can see the content uh, playing now. Uh, on the top right corner, you have a small uh, icon with, um, will act, if you click on it, it will activate a panel. We will show uh, textual information about the content of the machine. So the, the machine are based like mostly visually, then they have like a panel of, uh, of uh, uh, information about the, the machine. Could be a link or I can, I will let uh, Aladdin speak a bit more about the content. And there's another panel with a bit something more personal, like uh, Aladdin write something about the, the, the data. Yeah, so for each uh, uh, coming from this grid, you zoom, I'm trying to also describe the visual aspect of it. You kind of hover over a large grid. Uh, if you select an item, you zoom in, and we're seeing that now. Uh, then there's another layer in each um, uh, machine or in each cell, uh, which has text. And there's another layer of text, so it's a, a kind of zooming in and zooming out and hovering over a field. So perhaps that is a bit of a B metaphor of uh, ways of gathering data in a way that that you could swarm or uh, fly over information and quite randomly or through learning to hover, uh, uh, find uh, different pieces of information. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Uh, if, if we go back on the, on the, on the main screen with the, with the grid, you will see as well that there is like two green button with one with EM and the one with a menu uh, icon. When you uh, navigate the, the grid, this uh, button will uh, move as well. They are always like stuck on the, on the border of the page, but uh, you, can, uh, you can play with them to, to move them. And these buttons are uh, basically as well uh, have action. If you click on the uh, okay. like IM from, button. From a is? design perspective, I think these buttons and the, the hovering are intended to uh, promote a playfulness or to engage with the information. So from a graphic design point of view, we aim at creating this interface in such a way that you find something to discover in it, 
maybe it's not immediately clear, but as you go along, uh, there's a playfulness to it, which invites you hopefully to <laughs> find your way. Yeah, I think the, the question of, of, of game and playing was quite central in the design of this, like, and trying to find also a, a way of approaching this, this content, this data, not in a too linear fashion and not like in the academic version. While obviously we always source and bring the possibility to access this academic knowledge. And as, yeah, Ari was talking about the button, maybe I can, I will activate uh, the first one on the right, which is, basically another way of navigating the website. So a more conventional one by a list where you have directly the name of the content being a video, images, a graph, and then the name of the people that created the content. So the, usually it's a team at a lab university. And he also tells you which type of machine it is. If it's like a video, if it's a sound, or if it's a graph, or if it's a slide of images. And I think it's quite important to, to, to acknowledge and notice that this is the first step and we aim to grow as well the possibility of machine, like include live content at some point or include also 3D models and something we talked already a lot about it with, with all of us and that we will build in the future. Yeah, yeah. maybe it's good to say about this uh, second interface, so besides the grid interface, there is, like you say, a more conventional interface to access the machines, a menu, let's say. Um, this this uh, one can be sorted by title, by author, uh, by machine type, uh, and you can also search in it. And this is also to facilitate different types of use, or maybe if you're uh, highly informed about uh, the type of data that is in there, you could also search it and find something specific you're looking for. Um, so there's also a more um, directed way of navigating in this uh, alternate me menu. So, and so basically, and brightly oh, green. It's a, it's a, a very uh, strong color green. <laughs> yeah, and I, I use actually the. The navigation, I did a research, like looking for CO2 level, and then it shows like in this, when I typed bees, obviously there were mostly all the data coming and then I just typed CO2 and I, by clicking, I will simply open the machine. So the same way that you can open it when you navigate it to the grid. So here I open a new page to, with a black background and you can see on the image a graph uh, showing like here it's the record of the level of CO2 inside a beehive over a period of six months in 2019. This was recorded at the EPFL in Lausanne, which is a university in Lausanne, Switzerland, by uh, a team of research uh, composed of uh, Robert Mills and Raphael Barnack that generously provided the, the content for it. And this shows this is the, the idea of graph is also really important for smart eyes because now it's a bit evolving, but at the beginning, mostly the content you were getting uh, as a beekeeper was just a graph of like the daily activity of your beehive, like the difference in weight, the difference in temperature or in humidity or even different type of data could be gathered. And here we can say that the graph offer to have an overview of the last the six months in 2019 how we actually manage to to change the level of CO2 according to their needs. And you can also click them on different or specific months, for example, and see how the graph reconstruct and rebuild following maybe having I mean, yours without something with that. We I think it was a really nice reference with the grid actually. Uh, yeah so it it was it was quite interesting to to work with this graph. So we, we tried to, to find a way that uh, uh, it's a bit uh, friendly to show uh, this data. And so we, we work on this. Uh, I don't know if it's really uh, working well with the Zoom connection, but there is an animation between uh, each, uh, each graph where the, the, the graph is um, erasing and then all the, the axis, the coordinate are like redrawing to go to new place and then the graph is uh, uh, right, uh, drawing again uh, on it with a good point. And this uh, 
So basically, there's two uh, ways. There's like the line who showed the coordinate, and the coordinate themselves show really the crossing of the line, what are the data uh, itself. So I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, I think uh, the graph uh, offered an uh, interesting opportunity to rethink a bit how to visualize uh, data. And from a graphic point of view, it was a bit of a discovery for us to not use all the lines uh, that could be in the grid, but only the lines where there are data points. Um, so this might seem like a small detail, but actually it points at something that Aladdin, you um, came to us and that we discussed, which we thought was very interesting, that this data, I keep calling it data, but this information could be accessed in different levels. And that because it is a public platform, uh, you could you should allow in a way as much uh, types of access as possible. So maybe someone wants to uh, view or listen or engage with it uh, for very different reasons than you intended. Maybe you just want to look at it because it's beautiful or because uh, it sounds beautiful or you have your own mm, interest in it or um, structural thought about it to access it. And at the same time, it could be something which is highly informational. So another thing that also struck me was the quality of the data and research that you tap into, which I mostly learned by compliments that you kept receiving from researchers that you worked with. So I did want to point out this uh, high quality of data um, yeah, raises the platform to, uh, I think, very interesting level. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and maybe I will slide to another machine. And uh, as we said, so there's different type of machine. And I will go to one that we didn't explore yet. So we saw like this video, this slide images. That's quite classic. And there's also like some based on sound. So I will play a little bit of this one. Let me know if you hear something. It's bizarre. Don't worry. <laughs> So this is basically the thoracic vibration of a stingless bees that was, uh, so if you click, as we explained, if you click on the right top corner, you can have info about why you just listen or why you've just seen. And here is the thoracic vibration of a stingless bee that was recorded uh, in a studies by, uh, and provided generously by Mikhail Anse. Uh, so I'll let I, um, I see the the sign language interpreter making wing uh, looking movements. Yes. Yeah. Sound indeed made by wings. No, it's actually, uh, it's like measured with a laser vibrometers. So it measured the vibration and it's directly stick to the back of the stingless bees in order to be able to record like, and uh, this is a way they used to communicate because yeah, it's, it's interesting to raise that because we never forget that bees don't have ears, so they don't hear the sound as we do. They feel the sound with the entire body, so there's no point of entry for them about the sound. It comes from their hair, from the antennas. So they feel the sound properly, and this is a really important way of communicate for them in the inside of this black box that sees the hive, because we used to represent uh, some of the communication with a dance, which is became quite famous, but this is a visual representation, right? And from a design point of view, it's quite interesting then, uh, or from a viewer point of view, like we're representing something that we measure as a sound, in this case, a recorded sound. But if the bees only feel vibration, there's already a translation. And it's a shame then that uh, a website or a device could not vibrate already. Well, phones can, but we, we can't uh, at this moment control it to the extent that we could really communicate 
or, or, or uh, convey the vibration that happens that was recorded. So I think you just opened like uh, uh, something to, to dive like maybe on the telef the app version one day, like if we can make it vibrate and yeah, that, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's nice. And I think this leads us, yeah, to the question of, of sound that, uh, that quite fascinating about the world of bees and from a really personal anecdote, I never really thought about the question of sound before I went to do fieldwork in Morocco. I never thought about it because I learned beekeeping with my grandfather, but he was totally deaf. So he never used any sound clues in his apiary. And when I did this fieldwork and I went there with Laurent Goudel, which is with us tonight, uh, I think we, we realized interviewing uh, beekeeper Ko Hassan, Swaf Hassan, uh, that used a lot of the sound cues to know at these is bees behave and to know how to act basically uh, in this practice of beekeeping. And I think this is a good end for the navigation to now leave the floor to Laurent. We will play a piece that he composed and then um, maybe I've given the microphone to him or maybe you want to start straight away, Laurent, you, you decide. Now I can speak a little bit. <laughs> uh, do you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Oh, yeah, I have also a... A little anecdote also because when we went uh, in Morocco with Aladdin, um, I never, I never heard the sound of the inside of a beehive, and when I hear it for the first time, I was like, "Whoa, that's intense!" And also, I was like, "It sounds a little bit like my music, actually. It's like noise, drone, chaotic stuff. So it has a strong impression on me. So yeah, that's why we started to kind of mix." Uh, also the sound of the bees and the music I usually do. So, okay, I'll try to use the tape machine. Do you hear some sound? Yeah.
So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Lomo. It was really nice. Really, really enjoyed it. I mean, as usual, I think that's why we got along with <laughs> this kind of music and this kind of experience. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was fun. I know it's weird to do some, some those kind of stuff on Zoom. Yeah, it's a visa experience, right? <laughs> And I guess it also shows how this web uh, platform and intimacy machine can be used for other kinds of, um, you know, aesthetic encounters, sound encounters, and potentially how the project can evolve outside of just the platform. Yeah, exactly. And how the data could be actually reroute and use it differently. And I think that was a good example because some of the sound come actually from some of the data. But yeah, I think I would like to say that. It's definitely an ongoing platform and the core of the projects is the idea to update it on a regular basis and to follow like latest research and trying to build more closer collaboration. I think we, we started that uh, with recently with the APFL in Lausanne and with the University of Graz in Austria, which uh, quite exciting possible outcome with them. And so it really, I really hope that the machine could be more polymorphous and take also like more physical uh, shapes like as an exhibition or a book and then this will allow us uh, not only to add machine on the website with Ari and Joris about live data or, or other type of possibility but also include like haptic technology or the question of smell or yeah to broader basically the spectrum of our investigation of the world of bees. Yeah and even though I mentioned at the start that this project has underpinnings in visual anthropology, I think actually the use of the word visual is, is also too limiting nowadays. But if we take it from this idea to mean that we're pushing for a move away from traditional text-based research, even though we do also have a text which underpins the platform as well, but we're trying to figure out what other kind of modes can make this more accessible to a wider audience through maybe different sensorial modes as well. And also, whilst the intimacy machine is supported by scientific data, the research in its original format is not always available and its terminology can be very restrictive. And that's something that the platform tries to break down and, and something that we've tried to do within the writing on the platform itself and like shown in the visualisation of the graphs. Um, and I, I mean, I also won't lie, I'm, I'm not a bee expert, I, I'm becoming one. Um, but through, I guess, like the way I've tried to contribute to the project is, um, is to try to break down some of this knowledge uh, and take some of the ideas that are central to the intimacy machine and central to beekeeping and install them within like a, a wider context and, and hope to make it more accessible. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, before concluding, I also say like, I don't know if Ari and Yoris, so if you have any final notes you would like to add, it, or Laurent as well, this space now and then after we'll briefly conclude and we will move uh, also to the lounge if there's questions because we didn't really have, we don't really have time for the questions, but we're happy to take them later in the lounge room. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, we worked on this together, but you are the project uh, owner and drive behind it. So maybe it's a good moment to congratulate you on the official lounge moment. <laughs> uh, say thanks for a very uh, interesting and worthwhile and uh, yeah, thought expanding uh, collaboration. Uh, also, by the way, thanks iBeam and uh, closed captioners and interpreters for a very carefully uh, staged uh, event and day. Uh, maybe Ari, do you have something to add? Uh, no. I'm no, we I said no, but I don't think. Um, I think that as Aladdin said, what is kind of interesting is now it's, it's a platform with like welcoming new machine and new way to to deal with this data, and so it's uh, it's like beginning of of something. Is like we are launching something who invites to 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 have more data, more collaboration, and this is always uh, yeah, it's, it's always super interesting. It's and uh, yeah, congratulations, Aladdin. Thank you. A congratulations to all of us, then I would say. And thank you really much for that. And I think just, yeah, 
just to stress that again, but it's really the beginning of a project. And when the APFL agreed to collaborate with us, they asked me like, we need you to, to be at least having this platform available for the next five years, because we have a five year stem with our research and we need something on the long term. So yeah, it's just the beginning. And uh, ultimately, I would just like to stretch the idea to that the intimacy machine and the smart hive are not techno fixes. They're not here to replace our relationship with bees. They're here to, we need to use them in order to enhance them. And I don't want this to be just a footnote of it. And it, for me, it's really important to also understand all the question that brings using technology, especially when we talk about environmental issues. So I'm, I'm happy to continue this discussion alongside with all of you. And thank you very much again. And all IBM team that has been amazing, all the translator, all the yeah, all you. the thing I learned through IBM fellowship was invaluable. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> See you all in the lounge and soon, really soon. <laughs>